Hey, before we get started, I want to talk to you a little bit about our theme for this quarter, growing and protecting your portfolio. We're excited about various topics centered around this, but it really comes down to three concepts that will help you grow and protect your portfolio. You can find a PDF on our website about this. Go to wiserinvestor.com, scroll down to the bottom, enter your email address, and you'll get the PDF titled Three Ways to Grow and Protect Your Portfolio. Thanks for listening. Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast, where we cover financial topics such as retirement planning, tax planning, portfolio management, insurance, and estate planning, so you too can have a wiser retirement. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial success, are my co-hosts, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. Hi, Casey. How's it going? So I was on uh, Twitter recently, and I discovered uh, this whole account uh, called TikTok Investors, and Matthews, you probably already know about this, but... um, I'm a little behind the times sometimes. That's right. <laughs> you know, I'm millennial. Uh, so anyway, it's interesting uh, on this account that's basically just just uh, replicating what people are posting on TikTok uh, about giving financial advice. And, you know, there's this guy on there and he's like, well, I buy crypto right when it comes out. New, talking about new coins. And then when it hits an all-time high, I sell it. And that's how you make millions. I'm like, buy low, sell high. Right. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Just time it perfect and you're good. (laughs) That's uh, very innovating. Uh, But anyway, I I just kept, it's, it's, it's just like, it just sucks you right in. So I kept, I just kept scrolling to the next one, to the next one. It just made me realize that, man, what a, what a low barrier to entry our field has. And these guys aren't even in our field. They're not even licensed advisors or anything, right? They're just anybody who can record themselves on a, on a, uh, phone right which said social media because they aren't registered they can kind of say whatever they really want that's very true easy way to, to get information out there that's uh not reliable um but yeah i mean really but even though even our own industry you go and get a series 65 a series 7 and you're an advisor right i mean it's that easy it doesn't mean you're a good one it just means that you are one and as long as you can convince people to buy whatever you're selling then you could be a good one, right? And and that's the problem with our industry. We have uh, the bulk of people in this business are out there selling products. They're not actually giving advice. So I think I think that there's a huge void for podcasts such as this, uh, and even a YouTube channel as well, um, to give out good advice from people who actually uh, put a little thought into what they're talking about. And you know, I hate patting ourselves on the back, uh, but I just, I just think that there's a great opportunity. So before we hop into our main topic for today, um, you know, I, I was, I was thinking last week when we were starting to prep for this podcast, uh, there are so many ETFs out there now. I remember starting in 2004 is when we first started building all ETF portfolios here at Wiser and it, it was pretty easy. I mean, you only had, only had like 200 to choose from and now that Brad Weather, Five thousand. There's over five thousand ETFs now. Absolutely, yeah. Here uh, and abroad, so it, it's uh, uh, it's amazing all the different themes. You know, we we for the most part we stick to core ETFs. Um, that's our investment philosophy. Uh, works good, lasts lasts a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but you you can you dream up something, you can figure out. Th- there's probably an ETF already out there created for you to invest invest in or with, really. Um. So anyway, I, I was looking at uh, uh, the inverse ETFs. Uh, they have, this, this is not a new concept. It's just something I went back and revisited. This is not a strategy that we would use here at Wiser, partially because why would you want to be short the market when the market is up typically seven out of 10 years? Over the last 10 years, has been up uh, nine out of the last 10 years. So anyway, uh, the ProShares short series. Uh, ProShares short S&P 500 uh, is basically negative one times the market. So this year, the market's down seven, uh, that fund's up seven. You can also get the ProShares Ultra Short, which is two times short the market, which is up about 14% right now, year to date. Now, over the last year, um, it's down, It's uh, the market's up 13%. So the negative one times is down 14, and, and the two times is down 26%. Um, but you start 
you know, you, you have to be careful when you get into the special ETFs. Um, when I start diving deeper into pro shares, uh, how they do this is you don't actually own any securities. You're, you're holding derivatives. Um, so basically swap agreements and future contracts plus cash, which could be treasury or just cash. Um, when you, that mix is what creates that, that inverse relationship. Even on the, their, in their own prospectus, they talk about uh, you never want to hold an inverse fund for more than a day. So typically you're going to hold an inverse front. You're going to buy it at the market open and you're going to sell it before the market close simply because um, it re-leverages every single morning. So when you buy the S&P 500 just straight up, you know, IBV, SPY, whatever, um, you know, it, it'll, it could open up the next day and you, you don't get to participate in that, that difference, right? If it closes at 500 and it opens at 510, the only way to get to 510 is that you should have bought it at the close yesterday, right? So there's some compounding over time that builds with that. With an inverse fund, you're going to buy it um, and then it resets itself. It's like the game, the casino uh, hands you back your original money, <laughs> right? And it starts, it starts all over again. Uh, but you get back what you made or lost that day. It doesn't carry into the next day. So when you buy an inverse ETF, um, there's some risk involved. You could, you, there is a situation where you could lose all your money in one day. So if you put 20% of your portfolio, because that's probably about how much you'd have to put in to fully leverage something. If you put in 20% of your portfolio into this fund and the market has one of the best days ever, you could lose everything. That's a possibility. Uh, compounding risk uh, that we already talked about that, but that that's just where um, your money rolling forward. So if you lose 20% one day and then the next day you lose another, I mean, it gets worse and worse. Right. And there's more typically, Brad, you have to help me out with this, with a stat, but there was something out there. Um, well, I, I know that some of the best days are after the worst days. Right, so the right. market goes down two thousand. You get scared, then you go buy an inverse ETF. Um, it could be the next day is the day that it rebounds, right? Right. Uh, and then there, I, th- I think there's more, like the down days are, there, there's there's more up days than down days across the market. It's just sometimes the down days are bigger. I think that was a Morningstar study I showed uh, or I, uh, um, I read. It's been a few years ago, uh, coming out of the crisis, the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. Um. So anyway, uh, the point is, is that, hey, there's a, there's a whole series out there of, of negative ETFs, meaning you can short the, um, the NASDAQ, you can short the S&P 500, you can short small caps, you can short mid caps. I think I saw one you can sh- short small and mid. It was like the, uh, everything but the S&P 500, basically. Short foreign. Um, so any type of theme that you could come up with, there's probably an ETF out there that covers that theme right now. You just got to understand what that theme is. Exactly. And you have to do what I did. You have to actually open up the prospectus and read through the prospectus so that you have a full understanding of, of, of how it's built and what's, what's supposed to happen. I remember, I remember in 2008 walking around a conference in Florida and everyone just had a stunned look in their face, but every single panel for that investment conference was talking about inverse ETFs. Cause there was a point in time where the market was down, um, you know, 30 something percent and the inverse funds are also down 16. <laughs> People are like, how's this happen? Well, it's cause you, 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 you had more up days, but then you had these huge, huge down days. Right. But they were big still in 2018 and then 2020 when people were trying to time the market saying, well, if I think the market's going up, then I should buy these. And, um, like you said, uh, pretty speculative and they're extremely risky. Um, if you don't, aren't timing it right. Yeah. I, I, I don't think this is a um, at-home investment. I think this is something that professionals should be using to hedge large positions. Possibly, um, I don't. I've never met anybody that buys it thinking, "Okay, I'm going to make money today off of this." Of course, I don't know too. Statistically, that's who was buying it. Then um, individuals. That, that's where yeah. they got in trouble. Well, there there was talks about banning individual investors from it, um, but I don't know how you do that uh, in a free market like we have in the United States. So. Anyway, um, what did you find, Matthews? Yeah, so kind of similar to that is uh, the Jets ETF. I wrote about this, uh, I guess, a year or two ago, kind of during the COVID sell-off. Uh, what it is is an ETF of 
uh, some of the top holdings of airlines. So Delta, American, United, they're making up a majority of this. Uh, the top 10 airlines make up almost 60% uh, over over the overall ETF. Um, it's actually up year to date, which is surprising. So while the market's down, um, it's actually up almost 5%. Um, however, um, what happened, this was when retail investors kind of bet against Warren Buffett uh, during the COVID sell-off. He got out of airlines, uh, obviously knowing what was about to happen with the industry a lot of uh retail investors said well i think it will rebound at some point so they got into the etf and and from then it's actually done well so uh, from february 18th to march 20th uh of 2020 it was down over 58 percent um so it participated fully in that sell-off uh however since uh march 20th uh, to now it's actually up over 77 percent so if you're able to actually time it perfectly at the bottom and uh ride it out till then uh it's done great uh and year to date it's done great but uh, still over the last year and three years, even the last three years, it's down almost 30%. So uh, not a great overall uh, ETF performance-wise uh, unless you actually were able to time it uh, from the bottom. But it kind of goes back to your point of these thematic ETFs that you're able to uh, buy the overall instead of speculating on which airline was going to re- uh, recover better from the, the COVID sell-off. You kind of just bet in the overall uh, airline industry that it would recover. Uh, and if you're able to kind of... Uh, play it at the bottom, then it, it's worked out for you uh, long run year to date. Yeah, I mean, your, your top holdings are Delta, United, Southwest, American, Spirit, Alaska, Air Canada, JetBlue, Sun Country, and Allegiant. So those are all uh, pretty, for the most part, pretty big players in, in, in the field. And, and to your point, you don't have to uh, bet on one. You just, you're, you're just grabbing the group. And that's so, so true of so many other ETFs that are out there the same way, you know, if you wanted to um, grab only you know, energy, you, just, you can grab all the energy companies. You don't have to pick one stock. Right, right. with the uh, with the technology that's available to these ETF sponsors now, they can they can slice the nice the the economy and the marketplace any way they want. Yep, by industry sector, as we're talking about energy, industrials, real estate, financials, etc. Or you can within that you can slice and dice it right down to the industry. The sector itself, like airlines with right. industrials, so yeah, you can. Uh, and they're all done for a purpose. All these, you know, right. we're, we're overlaying factors on top of indexes now, and even themes to go along with that, in order to pinpoint a specific type of investment with characteristics that the investor wants for whatever purpose that they want them. You know, a, a good example is even dividend payers. Right, they can take the those companies that you know are increasing their dividends year over year or those companies that pay a high yielding dividend and put those into a basket or an index and then mimic that and offer that to investors regardless of sector regardless of anything else but pinpointing identifying a specific theme and or factor that goes along with that that's right just gotta have an overall arching uh theme within your portfolio too it's not just having a bunch of random thematic or uh uh, random ETFs that don't really uh, have a plan within your overall financial plan. What'd you find, Brad? Well, later in the conversation, we're going to be talking about small caps and picking a uh, an appropriate, in fact, even hopefully the best small cap index ETF. So along with that, I found an ETF within that small cap category that uses factors to choose its constituency in order to for its ETF investments. So I went to school in the Midwest at Iowa State University, which is an agricultural school, right, out there in farm country. I found an ETF company that names their ETFs after cattle and other agricultural products. So the one I picked has the name CAF, C-A-L-F. I just thought that was interesting. It's a small cap ETF that utilizes a universe within the S&P 600 small cap uh, companies and then ranks them by their free cash flow from 1 to 100, okay, and then excludes the other 500. So you have the top 100 companies in the S&P 600 with the largest free cash flow. So by doing that, they're trying to identify companies that have a high quality of balance sheet and are producing revenues that exceed their operating expenses and their capital expenditures. And what's left and that free cash flow can be used for paying dividends to shareholders, can be used for research and development, 
expanding plant and equipment, et cetera. So that's interesting. It's very specialized and I've not heard of this ETF, but um, it's kind of like cash calves, calves. Is that, is that what it is? Except the <laughs> exactly. Dogs of the yeah. Dow yeah. now and anyway, cash cows, cash, cow, cow, cash calves. calves. Yep. Um, yeah. Is there any significant outperformance of the strategy? Have, have well, you- we'll see over different time periods. Of course, you know, this is one of the things that you look at when you look at ETFs and trying to figure out which one is right for you and your portfolio. And over different time periods, investors um, identify and recognize certain types of company characteristics that they want to invest in. Other times, they see those same companies with those same characteristics and opt for others instead. Mm-hmm. So it's a growth versus value, size market cap versus small versus large, et cetera. Nothing actually changes in the in the composition, but it's how investors recognize and reward them by putting their dollars with their and trying to, you know, uh, make their make money in that manner. So right. um, during different time periods, it's done quite well. Other time periods, it hasn't. And the longer the time period that look at, the CAF ha- ETF has outperformed, you know, the other broader indexes. But there are time periods in there that it hasn't. And as well, you, when you look at different characteristics, we're going to do this when we look at all the um, small cap indexes. You know, you look at things like, you know, what is their standard deviation, which is the, the variation of returns from what's expected in any given time frame. You look at your maximum drawdown, which is from the highest level that it's peaked at to what is the next lowest level it's dropped to. And that's called your, your drawdown. The maximum drawdowns, you find these two points in time where what is the from the peak to the bottom before it gets back to the peak again, what's that maximum drawdown? So that actually is also part of your, your volatility. And then it's just looking at your expenses and looking at, the, again, the constituency of your universe in the portfolio itself. So these are all different things you look at other than just return itself. So let's go ahead and transition then. Uh, let's talk about choosing the best small cap ETF for our portfolios. Um, you know, what's interesting to me is small caps historically have have assumed, not me, but the market's always assumed that small cap ETFs are going to outperform large cap because they're smaller companies, they're growing, they're the next Amazon, they're the next Google, right? And that that hasn't really been the case for a while. The S and P 500 has literally pretty much eliminated all its diversifiers. It's dominated the marketplace in returns. And that's over not the years. I wouldn't say that's normal over history, but we're, we're approaching a decade now where it's starting to look exactly that way. And so you're starting to get, we're starting to get questions. Why do I have small caps in my portfolio? Why do I have foreign stocks in my portfolio? Because the S and P keeps winning. Right. Mm-hmm. So what's the case for having small caps inside a portfolio right now? Well, there's a couple of different reasons to have it. And, and primarily you, you have small caps in there as a diversifier from large caps. Now, you mentioned that large caps have outperformed for a number of years now, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen going forward. In, in addition, the two types of asset classes, they don't always return the same return streams at the same time. So they have a non-correlated return stream. And what we're looking at doing when we're adding these different asset classes like small caps, like international, things that although they haven't performed as well point to point, during different periods of that time, they may have outperformed any other asset class. So you have it, your portfolio that has a smoother return stream or as a portfolio, we're trying to lower the standard deviation of returns because we're trying to peg a long-term rate of return based upon the requirement of our client who has objectives in the future. If you look at that, it's called the quilt chart, a lot of people call it, where it's showing different asset classes. The Ibbotson chart. Exactly. Yes. So you obviously sometimes the one that's at the very top one year will be the very bottom the following year. Right. Um, the last five years has probably been all large cap growth, so yeah. um, it's a little different. But even if it's at the top, that doesn't mean that it has higher long-term returns. It just means in that time period, it was the best performing asset class. And that's part of you know creating a whole portfolio is that you want to participate at any given time in the best performing asset class. And then within that, since we pick core ETFs, 
you want to be participating, and we're assured that we are, in the best performing sector at any given time because they're all participating in that core ETF. So it's the best performing industry or sector and best performing asset class at any given point in time. Yeah, but you don't have to, we can't pick that. We can't say, like in emerging markets, we can't say, okay, Russia right. is the best one. No. Oh, no, now I'm going to go buy right. China. No. I'm going to go buy. That's very difficult. And so we're drawing, you know, we're, we're, we're investing in the broad based index itself. Correct. Right. And that goes back to our active versus passive podcast where mm-hmm. you, there's things you can do to, to a portfolio in the short term and, and beat beat the, these averages or these core asset classes that we're talking about. But long term, you have a 94% chance of winning just by owning the S&P 500, by owning the 600, by owning the S&P 400, right? Mm-hmm. Versus trying to pick out individual sectors. Uh, and, and also too, you know, S&P as well as other uh, index providers, they they rank their the companies by asset size. So it, by market cap, mm-hmm. right? So automatically the best is going to filter to the top, right? And then you have on the other side, you've got um, the worst will start filtering to the, to the bottom. And when the worst starts performing better, like energy, <laughs> right. it's, it'll start growing inside the, inside the portfolio to be a bigger, bigger percentage. I, don't, I, I can't remember what energy it is now, maybe two and a half percent of the S and P. It's very right, low. But to, to your point, back to in 2010, sector. 2011, it was the largest sector yeah, you that's know, right. in the economy. And now technology is correct. And so organically the, the size of the sector is, is fungible. Okay. It moves inside the S and P 500, the S and P 600, et cetera, without us having to try and predetermine what's that, what's going to be the the largest size. It's all in the, in the core itself. You know, what's interesting is, all right, the S and P 500 is by far the best performing asset class over the last decade, maybe two decades. But what if it wasn't the best performing asset class? What if small cap was the best performing asset class and S&P wasn't? Because when you turn on the news and they report what the Dow and the S&P have done, they report the Dow and S&P. They don't say small cap stocks have underperformed the market today by, (laughs) right? So we're kind of in this weird time where, the best is being reported daily, but your diversifiers, like no one ever talks about the real estate index. No one ever talks about the foreign index, right? Small cap, mid caps, that none of that gets reported. They just say the market. When they say the market, they're usually talking about the Dow industrial average or the S and P 500 or the NASDAQ or treasury. Uh, that's that's about what you about, get. Yeah. yeah. Forgot about NASDAQ. Yeah. The NASDAQ, right. Or yeah. Where, where treasuries did even on financial news media, it's, it's, Dow, S and P, Nasdaq, Treasury. That's that's it. So we talk about diversifiers. That's everything else outside of large cap stock. If all that is underperforming the S and P five hundred, what will happen is people are going to gravitate to own one hundred percent of the S and P five hundred because when they look down and say, "Oh, I just put all my money in this," and that's not horrible to have all your money in the S and P five hundred. I can think of much worse things. You could buy an inverse fund. <laughs> And hold it, right? You can buy the Jets ETF and hold it. (laughs) Put all your money in there. Um, So my point is, is that we can't throw out diversification just because what we diversify into hasn't performed as well as the S&P 500. It's all made money over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of money over the last 10 years. Just hasn't performed the same as Apple and Google and all the tech names that everyone talks about right now. Yeah, that's right. From point to point that we're referring Correct. to from 10 years ago to today, that's point to point. Right. right. Mm-hmm. So as good stewards, good managers, we have to, we have to diversify portfolios. We can't put everything into one asset class. That does, it doesn't make sense. That's not how you manage risk. Right. I mean, if you put everything to the S and P 500, because that's, that's what's been winning. You're not guaranteed that in the future. And when it falls and everything kind of reverts to its proper place, you're, 
you know, you're going to be in a bad spot, right? You would have, uh, think 2020 participate in 30% or 2008 right. when you fully participate in what you see on TV. It's a little different when that happens. Well, that's another, that's another good point too, is because I feel like in all the, all the crises that we've had in modern, modern times, everything has reverted to one. Right. The correlations that you're referring to. Yeah. Right. The correlation has reverted to one. So your diversifiers didn't help you a whole lot. In the financial crisis, bond. not in the crisis sense, but in the day to day sense, it, <laughs> yes, it, it does. Right. Yes. It's returned to normal for normal everyday investing. Yes, bonds yeah. are. I, I look at it on my phone. I, I rank all of our holdings in our firm by by risk, and so at the bottom are all my bonds. And so when I look at it, man, the market was down five hundred today, and I see all the negative ETFs, and then I get down to the bonds, and they're all green most days. And I think, well, that's. That's re- that's re- that's a relief. <laughs> There's something in the portfolio that actually went up today, not by much, but it went up. Right. Um, so that goes back to small cap stocks. So right. why do we invest in small cap stocks? It's for diversification. It's because over the long term, these companies have more upward room to move. Right. So it begs the question: Are all small cap indexes alike? And the answer is really no. The index themselves itself is very different, okay? So let's take a look at the three major small cap indexes, for example. The S&P 600 small cap, okay? The S&P 600 small cap is a part of the greater universe of the S&P 1500 composite. So in the S&P 1500 composite, you have the top 500 for the S&P 500, you have the middle 400 for the mid cap, and then the bottom 600 for the small cap, okay? Compare and contrast that just from a number standpoint from, to the Russell 3000. So the Russell 3000 is a universe of 3,000 companies, publicly traded companies in the U.S. The small caps are the bottom 2,000. Okay. So right there, you have a completely different universe in which to, to invest in. Mm-hmm. A, a third um, major small cap is the CRSP, which is the but the Center of, for Research of Securities Pricing. This is managed by University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Okay? And they've been around for a very long time. A lot of institutions use this. Okay? It, too, has a very different composition. It is the lowest in, in, in all the publicly traded securities in the U.S., ranked from 1 to 100, or reverse that, and top is 100, the lowest being 1%. So we're looking at from 2 to 15, okay, in the percentage range. So it's very small, okay, in its market cap composition. When you compare these three major small cap universe funds, indexes, you get very, very different return streams and very, very different statistical analysis. Does, so does the CRSP, does that get down to the micro cap? They include micro cap? And no, so, that, well. Or is that one, is that below that? That's even below. Okay. Yeah, it's so even it below truly that. is all small cap. It's all small cap, right. But they, they rank it in, in percentages. Yeah. Okay. okay. So whatever the percentages are at any given time, small cap at the, at the extreme ends, maybe move into mid cap or may drop out, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's probably the, the biggest screen is going to be the S&P. Because they have the least number of holdings. Right. The S&P also has a factor that the other ones don't have, and that's a profitability factor. So for the past four quarters, including the last quarter, a company has to be profitable in order to be in the index itself. The Russell index has no such profitability um, factor whatsoever. So it's estimated that at any given time, between 30 and 40% of all the companies in the Russell 2000 aren't profitable. Okay. Now, does that mean they're bad investments? Eh, not necessarily. Sometimes when investors are um, looking for quality, they're, when they're looking for, for, for profitability you know, in a company, yes, the, S, the uh, Russell 2000 underperforms. When investors are simply looking for asset class, you know, uh, because a lot and the uh, Russell 2000, for example, has a lot more technology in it uh, than the S and P 600. You know, they that uh, the Russell 2000 does better. Okay. So let's look at some some examples here for if we could. The, 
when we looked at standard deviation, you would think that all the small caps would have a similar range of deviation, which is the range of expected returns from, from the norm itself. Volatility. Yes. So IJR, which is the iShares core S&P small cap 600, has a standard deviation of about 21. The Russell 2000 also has a standard deviation near that. It's around 22. The Vanguard small cap, uh, symbol VB, is also around 21. So from standard deviation, they're all approximately the same. The one that I would referenced earlier, CAF, has a standard deviation of 27, which I thought was unique when I saw that because here are these companies that have the highest free cash flow and the most profitability. But you see, it just depends on how investors are, are viewing these investments at any given time. The drawdown, I thought, was very interesting as well. The uh, S&P... Five, or S&P 600 had a drawdown of 50, maximum drawdown of 58%. The drawdown on the Vanguard product was 59%, whereas the drawdown on the cows, calf, excuse me, was only 47%. So the range of returns can vary, but the from top to bottom seems to, to differ slightly. Okay. Um, all these different indexes to consider the best in any given portfolio for any given purpose has to be made. The decision has to be made in context of the rest of the portfolio. So if you're investing in the S and P 500 for your large cap allocation, it makes sense to utilize the S&P 600 for your small cap allocation. Because what you're trying not to do is to have overlap. You're trying to have distinction of large cap and small cap at any given time in certain proportions. If you're blending your indexes by different index providers for your ETFs, what you're going to get is overlap and you're going to get less distinction in your portfolio itself. So it has to do not just with the, the metrics but also the composition of the rest of the portfolio at any given time. It's the same way with uh, foreign. You would never own a Vanguard foreign uh, developed stock fund and then add the emerging market from like iShares. Right. It's because it's how they think about who what's considered emerging markets. In some cases, South Korea is. In some cases, South Korea is not an emerging not. market. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the same way with mid, mid cap, small cap, um, you'd want to stick to S&P for – Large, mid, small, and, and stick to Russell or uh, or the uh, uh, CRSP uh, as well. So if you were going to look at returns, you know, for the past year, okay, the CAF is up about 8.5%. The Russell 2000 is down a little more than 10%. This is the past 12 months now. Yeah. Okay? In the past 12 months, the... S&P 600 is up about 1%, and the Vanguard uh, CRSP product is down about three and a third. Okay. Over longer time periods, three and five years, that's going to change a little bit. So if you're holding a, a period is like is five years or more, you know the S&P 500 index is up over 52%. The Russell is up only 44%. S&P 600, yeah. Did I keep saying that again? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, the Vanguard small cap is very compares very favorably with the iShare product for the S&P 600 at around 55%. The, the CAF is up more than that at about 65%. Can you over over five years. So, But it, you can see on a chart at different time periods, these are performed very differently. So this is where you get this change of, of volatility and drawdown that has to play into your decision. Right. Now, if you're just going to hold it and forever and not make changes, not rebalance, you know, point to point is, is, is a fine way of, of just considering it. But if you're going to do rebalancing, which we do, okay, you want something that has a little bit more of a consistent return stream with lower volatility so that when you rebalance, you're not taking the larger hit on the, 
and any losses that may be occurred at any given time. So, you know, I wouldn't say people are passionate about it, but people have um, definitely opinions on Russell versus S and P. And then there's the Vanguard product, which you don't ever hear about CRSP. It's just Vanguard. It's just Vanguard, small cap. (laughs) Right. Uh Um, You know, I've always liked the S&P having the um, kind of a quality factor to it, knowing that the companies had to be profitable in order to be to be there. And if it's not profitable, then it has to leave. Well, I like after, to think so as, as fiduciaries, knowingly. If it goes out of business, it has to leave. You know, we, we would not knowingly put clients in a non-profitable investment. <laughs> right. <laughs> True. But, you know, but I know advisors that, mm-hmm. that use Russell for everything. Absolutely. Prefer, you know, yeah. and it's definitely a more broad reaching um, but I, I feel like Vanguard kind of falls in the middle between those two and their, and their approach. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no right or wrong. It's just, it's just personal preference on, on how you want to replicate the market. Right. And how you're investing the rest of your portfolio and how all this mixes and matches together. Correct. So you're, you're not, you're not experiencing overlap. Right. That's okay. not, we've Holdings. talked about diversification. That's Being right. diversified is not holding different indexes that way. That's Right. That's right. You know, in, in the active space, when we see prospects come in and they've had several mutual funds and they think they're diversified, and yet when you compare holdings of the two, of the funds, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. No, I see that. And uh, 401k plans are starting to clean that up a little bit and not give people as many options, but I, I used to see that all the time. Mm-hmm. You'd have four large cap mutual funds and they would own all four and they go, well, yeah, I, I, I'm diversified because I split my money between these four, <laughs> four funds. Four funds. And right. You have four different managers, which is not horrible, but you really, you're, you're all in one asset class or all right. large cap um, asset class. So probably we'll see more of that as people start looking through their investment options that people will filter toward the higher performing one, which does not always mean it'll continue to be that way, which is why we have to have diversification, which is why we have this small cap conversation, uh, which you did a great job presenting, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, uh, looking forward to the next chat. Have a great week. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We would also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. We would love to hear from you. This episode was produced and edited by Lilton Moore. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.